So, next I'm passing on to the, the main event of the, of the day. Um, we are really, really fortunate to be joined by Dr Claire Reader today. Um, Claire is a lecturer in clinical psychology at the King's College in London. She's an author on, well, she's literally wrote the book on CRT. Um, if you look up CRT in research journals, you'll see Dr Reader, Dr Reader everywhere you go. Um, she's developed one of the, the, the um, games called Circuits, one of the, the software systems called Circuits. Um, and we were really fortunate at FEET and some of our NHS colleagues yesterday that she spent a day with us training us uh, and kind of working through some of the CRT that we developed to see if we can make any further improvements to the, to the outcomes that we're achieving. Um, so you realise the leading authority on CRT, I would say in the world, but I might be a bit biased, you know, I'm sure she's a bit more modest than that. But it is a genuine honour to have her here today, so I'll hand over now to Dr Claire Reader. Hello everyone, and thank you very much for that very generous introduction. Um, I've been really fortunate to hear a little bit about FEET and the introduction of cognitive remediation from the start. I met Gordon Mitchell, I think it was in about 2000, and, and then Inga and um, Vincent came down for the training. And I can honestly say that watching this develop, I think it's one of the most innovative and forward-thinking and well-developed cognitive remediation programmes that I've seen, certainly in the UK, but actually across the world. And so it's, it's a real honour to have been invited today, so thank you very much. Okay, so where's the... So I'm going to talk about cognitive remediation, obviously, and particularly about employment, but I'll tell you about it a little bit more generally. So I'll start off telling you a bit about um, the background um, using co um, cognition and employment. I'm, I'll particularly focus on um, cognitive remediation in psychosis and for people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia, mainly because that's what I know about, but also, obviously, that's a very large group of people who will be using it in feet. Um, and also, that's really where the literature is in cognitive remediation. That's where it began in mental health, and it the, really um, it's been developed. It's beginning to um, emerge in other disorders, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. But it's really been in psychosis. And I'll show you a little, a few cognitive remediation tasks, and tell you a bit more about what it is, and also what it isn't. And um, then I'll talk about the evidence base generally in cognitive remediation, but particularly in, for improving employment and work outcomes for people with mental health difficulties a little bit about who benefits most, and then about implementing it in practice, which I think feet are certainly the experts here. Okay, so in terms of the background, we know that um, unemployment in people with severe mental illness is incredibly high, and obviously that work is a really crucial thing for quality of life, and, and unemployment not only leads to poor quality of life, but reduces people's friendship and social networks, leads to increased poverty, people's recovery is damaged by not being in employment, and generally, it, it, you know, it's really a um, negative effect on people's well-being. Um, in, as I said, I'm going to focus primarily on, foc um, on schizophrenia and psychosis, and in 2012, um, the Schizophrenia Commission did a report which showed the costs are also very, very high to the NHS and society. Schizophrenia as a whole diagnosis costs the um, UK, sorry, this is England, um, nearly £12 billion a year, but nearly half of, more than half of these costs are accounted for by lost pro productivity in terms of unemployment. So it's a really big issue. In psychosis, there are very high unemployment rates from first episode right to um, people who've had um, a diagnosis for a long time. And whilst we can really improve employment outcomes using IPS, the Individual Placement and Support, which, again, FEET is really leading the way with, um, the outcomes are still um, not as good as we'd like, and in particular, people tend not. The research literature shows that people don't manage to retain jobs in the way that most of us do. So that you know, jobs last weeks and months rather than years. So how can we improve the employment outcomes? Well, this is a was a review um, in the last five years that looked at things that predicted how well people did in work and employment with and mental health problems, and they noted that there had been a real surge in interest in the role of cognitive function. And by cognitive function, I don't mean thoughts and beliefs, I mean things like memory, concentration, the ability to be organised and plan things, so sort of everyday thinking skills. And that's re received overwhelming support. It's a really big predictor of how well people do in employment. So this is what, a bit about what we know about thinking skills in people with a schizophrenia diagnosis. 
The top line is how people perform on a whole range of thinking skills, like how quickly they think, how well they remember things, how well they attend to information. But you can see that people... Oh, sorry. Um, people with a schizophrenia diagnosis, and this is a group of people who've had the illness for a very long time, but also um, people with the first episode of psychosis. They're performing really well below normal... Um, well below the normal range. And we know that these are really predictive of all kinds of different outcomes. So this is a quite a, an old study where they um, gave people work therapy and they looked at what predicted people's work behaviour, so work habits, their personal presentation and work quality. And what you can see in yellow is the amount of that that could be accounted for by their cognitive difficulties, so memory, attention and so on. But symptoms, surprisingly, really added nothing to this. It really does seem to be it's the cognition, not the symptoms that are driving some of these things. We also know that they affect some of the key things that are important in work, so the ability to get on with the people and function in a social situation. This is a study where they looked at people's social behaviour when they're recovering following an uh, acute admission. And the green... Um, oh, sorry, I'm mixing up my buttons... Um, this green line shows people who had poor memory, and you can see that their social difficulties remained the same in this 12 months after um, being discharged, whereas the people with a good memory, were, their difficulties were reducing and they were recovering. Again, symptoms really added nothing to this. We also know that these are long-lasting effects. So This is a very recent study with um, people with first-episode psychosis, and here, these are the cognitive difficulties they had and whether they were associated with these things. Now, these were assessed at one time point and then these things are five years later. So this is a really long-lasting effect on whether they were in full-time work or education, um, um, how long they'd been in employment and whether they were on benefits or not. And you can see that the ones that are starred, these are the ones that they were showed statistically significant associations. So even over that long period of five years, people in the first stages of psychosis, it's really having an impact. Um, this is a study where they looked at people's response to IPS, the Individual Placement and Support Schemes, to improve employment. And they either gave people the IPS or not, they had treatment as usual, and then looked to see out of these two things, the IPS and the thinking skills, which ones predicted some of the outcomes over the next six months. And as you might hope, they, um, having IPS did predict whether you're employed or not, but actually whether you, how your thinking skills were did predict much better whether you were in education, but also how many hours you'd worked over that six months. So, it does, so thinking skills not only predict how well you do in work, but how well you respond to our treatments to, or you know, ways to help people get into work. Finally, I think this is an important thing to know since costs are such a big issue at the minute. Um, this is looking at costs um, for service users in um, a mental health trust in South London. And these are the group of people with um, severe mental health problems with cognitive impairment. And this is the group without um, significant mental um, so, um, cognitive impairment. And you can see this group is costing the NHS a considerable amount more. I think that's always a useful thing to know when we're thinking about why this is impo so important to provide these sorts of services. So we know that there's a, an important relationship between thinking and functioning. And this has been the really driving factor with, with why cognitive remediation was developed. So I'll tell you a little bit about it, what it is. This is a definition by a cognitive remediation expert group that convened um, a few years ago, and it's a behavioural training-based intervention that aims to improve thinking skills like attention memory with the general aim of durable effects on community function, things like work, and I think that's probably the most important outcome really in the community function. So I'm going to say a little bit about, I hope, about what it's not, because I think sometimes there are some mis perceptions about cognitive remediation that can give it a bad press, but and I hope that will help you to tell you a bit about what it is. So um, it's, I think often we talk about it with people we're working with as a bit like brain training, because I think that's a very normative thing that lots of people are interested in that, but it, actually it's not exactly the same as brain training. There are some similarities, but there really is very little evidence for brain training. In fact, one of the big companies who provides brain training, Luminosity, has recently got fined £2 million um, in the States for... Um, trying to present that it was an effective thing when it's not really. But cognitive remediation, on the other hand, there is a really good evidence base for it, and it's a psychological intervention that's much more than um, just playing games on computers. <laughs>
One of the things that I think can look very unpalatable about cognitive remediation, if you look at the literature, is it looks like it's very organised around deficits and telling people they've got problems with their brain. Now, I think that's an unfortunate thing about the literature, because actually what happens in practice, and certainly hearing about feet, that's absolutely not what happens. This is about thinking about people's goals for recovery, and what is it that they want to gain from life, and how do they achieve those, and helping them to improve things in that respect. Now, there isn't a great deal of evidence about the, co the role of the coach or a therapist, but actually there's a kind of growing consensus, and we need to do this, these, some of these studies, to show that actually they're really important in helping people. This, again, this isn't just about getting people to go away and play on computers and learn games. This is a therapy where you know, people are really helped by having a personal relationship with someone who can help them to transfer what they learn in these tasks into everyday life. Again, there's this, this sort of feeling that we must score well and that if you don't score well, then you're not doing well and that, that can be a negative experience. But actually, what the aim of cognitive remediation is is to helping people to have a more systematic approach to, to tasks so that they can be a bit more organised, feel them in, more in control of things, know where to start with something new. And that feels quite different than about are you scoring well or not? One of the things that sometimes people talk about is, well, this doesn't account for the fact that these difficulties might be to do with trauma and isn't this all a bit based on the medical model? Well, actually, no, I don't think it is. I mean, I think it, this is based on research showing that cognitive problems are present in people with psychosis and they really predict how well people recover. And cognitive remediation teaches that these cognitive problems are very normal. We all have cognitive problems at different times in our life. It's associated with ageing and so on and that we look up the sorts of factors that um, can cause problems in thinking and help people to find their own ways of managing those difficulties, particularly using strategies, for example. There's been loads of different cognitive remediation programmes, um, often with the computer, um, not always, um, with all kinds of different emphases, and I think that's been one of the difficult things to compare how well they work. I'm going to just show you a few tasks from the one that we use in London, um, just to give you a flavour of the sorts of things that might, um, you might do in um, a cognitive remediation programme. So we, we start off with very gentle um, tasks that are not based in the real world, just to get people having the feel of what it's like to do some of these thinking skills and start to think about what they're good at and what they struggle with and what strategies they might use to help them. So in this task, oh, this task, what you have to do is to work out where the middle of the line is and then make a mark. So it's about finger along the line, for example. So it's introducing people in a very gentle way to using strategies and working in a systematic way. This is a task, a maze task, where you basically have to work out your route to get to the arrow. And often what you might see is people are very impulsive and get started without thinking it through and then find themselves in all kinds of trouble or some people um, get stuck and they're not sure what to do next. So this is another way of thinking about how you can help people to plan and think, think things through before they get started. As we move through the programme, we become more ecologically valid, which means you know, um, more close to the real world, if you like, and we might ask people to bring in stuff from home, so maps they might of their local area or stuff they're working on at college or a book they're reading, or we might help people to concentrate a bit more on watching TV, for example. But this is a task where you see your position on the map on the right-hand side and then you see yourself moving through the village on the left, so you kind of move around the town and then you have to work out where you've got to on the map so again you need to have some strategies to do that you might be switching your attention from one thing to the other you might be using your finger to point so very simple everyday strategies that probably all of us do without thinking but that we know that people with mental health problems often don't use those sorts of strategies and that causes problems and this is one about shopping so you've got some instructions in the middle here about what you want to get from your shopping list and then you've got to add them up and um, uh, get the total. So you have to use your memory, your concentration, planning, and then all kinds of strategies like writing things down, asking people for help, um, you know, keeping a list, those sorts of things. So the... the as I said, there's lots of different ways of doing cognitive remediation and there's, there's some disagreement in the field even about what each of these means. So 
There isn't a great deal of evidence for this yet, but I'd say there's a real general consensus in the field that you do need a kind of intensive training period where it's really lots of hours over several weeks, not or months actually, I should say, but several times a week. And I think that's one of the things that's been difficult for cognitive remediation because that's hard to um, deliver in the NHS or in other services because it requires so much intensive input. And I think Feet's done a brilliant job of showing how it actually can work in practice, but... Um, I'll tell you a bit about that later. And the idea is that you help people to build these broad-based schemas. And by schemas, I mean a kind of um, model in your mind of um, a pattern. So we, uh, there's lots of things that we all do without thinking. You can just go into automatic pilot. And so it becomes very easy to do things without having to think about things. And that, those are times when you've got a scheme or a model of how something should work. And the idea is that in cognitive remediation, you help people to build these new models of how they can approach different tasks. And so that behaviours then become more automatic rather than being very effortful. But what we see in terms of the brain organisation, nothing much happens in this early phase. And it's only when you're just consolidating this behaviour that some kind of reorganisation might take place in your brain. So that's why one of the reasons why we consider that it might be really important to maintain lots of um, practice over time, even though you know, people might be doing pretty well at it. So promoting self-efficacy, so I mean the kind of sense of feeling like this is me doing this, I'm in control, I know what I'm doing here, I'm confident about what I'm doing, and being motivated. And we know this is often a problem in people with um, a schizophrenia diagnosis. And this is achieved in lots of different ways, but I think one thing... Um, when we've done qualitative studies um, in London, one of the things that people say more than anything is that they like the person that they're working with, they like their coach. Um, and that's a really important part of this, that people develop a really supportive relationship with the people they're working with. And then the idea is that it often uses errorless learning and scaffolding, which means that people um, are doing tasks that are well within their capabilities, but maybe just stretching them a little bit. So consequently, people have a really good experience that they're succeeding and this is particularly important for people who've often had really difficult educational experiences because they may have had mental health problems from a young age and we also know that in psychosis people have often had there's research to show that the cognitive difficulties are, are emerging even at the age of about five or six and so you know people have often well I'm sure you'll know have very difficult educational experiences so it's a very positive experience for people and they've really um, shown how they're improving we also really try to focus on real-world goals. So what does this actually mean for me? Okay, I'm doing these tasks, but how is this going to help me? Am I ever going to help me? How is it going to be better for me if I'm concentrating? And often that's small things like I can watch a whole episode of something I want, or it might mean that I can do my college homework, or, you know, in this case, getting back into work. And finally, focus on transfer. And by transfer, I mean moving f skills from one situation to another, um, and although there are these um, lots of studies showing that these two are very much related, we know that it's not a simple relationship. And for research, even from you know the general population, is very clear in that none of us are good at um, transferring one new skill into a different situation. They tend to be very context dependent. And so, cognitive remediation programs have thought about how to do this in different sorts of ways. Um, circuits is, which is the one that we do in London we try to build in a lot of this transfer into the therapy itself so we help people to think about their goals and how they're going to use these new strategies in everyday life other people I know you do this a lot in feet don't you? Um, providing bridging groups so helping people think through what I've got these new strategies where I'm going to use them and they're done in separate arenas from the cognitive tasks other people actually go into different situations and teach the new cognitive skills. There's a group in the States um, that led by Susan McGurk, and they teach some of the employment workers um, with the um, clients some of the strategies that they've been working with, and then the supported employment worker helps them implement them in, in the workplace. And then other people embed the cognitive remediation program within a much broader um, rehab program. So I've told you a bit about it, so does it work? And I'm going to start, first of all, by telling you about the general cognitive remediation literature because it's a bit further ahead than just the employment bits, I'm a small part of it, so we get a bit more information. But I will tell you about specifically the um, employment literature as well. So this is a meta-analysis, so analysis of, of all the um, controlled trials in women, 
often have relatively low levels of education, around 36 is a very uh, um, standard mean age, some involved inpatients, and most people really had quite a lot of symptoms still. Now, as I said, cognitive remediation can really vary in the way it looks. One of the key distinctions has been whether it relies just on drill and practice so that you're just repeating tasks over and over again with the idea that you might be improving your brain function as opposed to a more strategy-based approach, which is often what people are doing in Europe and certainly what FIT are um, doing, you know, helping people to develop new strategies that they can move into everyday life. Some people use a computer, others use pencil and paper. So, as I said, some are embedded in rehab, like support and employment services, others not. Um, and then the range of hours of treatment really varies too. In the States, they tend to even pay people for employment. We I'm trying to avoid this here, thinking it's a genuine therapeutic endeavour, really. But in the States, I think it's much more a commercial enterprise. So these are the, this is the whole range of studies. It's, it looks a, a horrendous side, but basically if... The lines fall on the left-hand side of the thick line, that means they haven't worked very well. And if the line falls on the right-hand side, that means they have. And as you can see, they've, it's, they're generally doing really well. Um, effect size, which sort of quantifies the amount of change. And 0.4 something is, a, is categorised as a moderate effect. So that's in terms of thinking skills, but in terms of functioning, we get a really similar good effect of, on functioning, and that can be all kinds of things, people's ability to live independently, look after themselves, work. And also some, um, I think this is a non-significant effect of symptoms, but it, it still um, you know, can be important. We also know these last, they're often, studies are often only um, have a six-month follow-up, but some of them are longer, and we can see that the changes do last over time, which is good. <laughs> And when this meta-analysis looked at all the differences in the kind of cognitive remediation that had been offered and which ones of these seemed to be most important, they found that actually nothing seemed to make a difference in terms of improving cognition. So they were all effective for improving cognition. But if we looked at the functioning, what the real-world outcomes, like work outcomes, for example, it was these two that were important. So basically, this was what happens if you... Um, divide the cognitive remediation groups up into the studies into people who'd just, just delivered the cognitive remediation on its own. And these are the studies that have used some kind of rehab. And in most cases, this will be in supported employment or some kind of employment service. So you can see that combining cognitive remediation with some kind of employment services is doing much better than just giving cognitive remediation on its own. So now the effect sizes are actually coming up into the large um, category. And then if you, if you look at the ones who've just given the cognitive remediation plus the additional rehab, like supported employment, and you divide them into the strategy-based approaches and the practice-based approaches, the strategy approaches are way ahead. So it does seem to be this is a, an important approach and doing really, really well if you're adding in um, something else. We know that people really like cognitive remediation. Often the, um, it's really hard to keep people in trials. And this was a participatory study with service users who carried it out. And they asked people who took part what they thought. And um, um, people do generally report, you know, this, this follows with what they say. People really like it, but often they say they really like coming to see the person they're working with. We also know it can have an impact on costs. So this was a study we did um, in London where we looked at costs of people, costs of um, healthcare and societal costs, so things like benefits. Um, this is the cognitive remediation group um, after um, receiving the cognitive remediation and the control group who hadn't um, received it. And there was an advantage for the cognitive remediation in that they had reduced costs after treatment. And we also know that it's having some kind of measurable effect on the brain, which often I think is helpful just to validate what we're doing, even though we can see behavioural changes. And actually what we see is that um, in, in people with mental health problems, often they have, um, in fact you can see it here, this dark green bar shows the um, activation of the prefrontal cortex using um, a working memory task. And the activation of the patients before cognitive remediation is much lower than in healthy controls here. And what you can see is after the cognitive remediation, the activation is increasing to get to the point at which controls are at the start. So that's a really positive thing. We seem to be activating people's brains a bit. But another important finding, this was a study with people with um, first episode psychosis who'd 
um, had cognitive remediation. And what we know in that group is that often there can be some shrinkage of the brain over the time. And actually, what this um, group showed was that good cognitive remediation prevented the loss of grey matter in the brain, which again, really positive finding. So in summary, for the general literature for cognitive remediation, and we know it produces durable effects, both for thinking skills and for functioning in general, and strategy-based programmes combined with rehab like IPS have really seem to be the ones that are doing the best. We know people really generally like it, and it leads to not only um, um, improvements in people's quality of life and um, what they're able to achieve, but also to reduce costs, and there are measurable effects on the brain. So I'm going to tell you a little bit now about the literature specifically for um, employment services. Again, this is a meta-analysis. So there were nine studies here, nine randomised control trials. Again, people with a schizophrenia diagnosis. You can see all of these are not in the UK, which is a great shame. There's not much going on here at all. I think our group in London is the one group that's doing kind of randomised control type um, research. So it's really brilliant to have um, you know, such a well-developed service here. Um, they all provided but one uh, um, extra work therapy or supported employment, but one study just looked at the work outcomes. And what, what they found was that employment rates for the people who had cognitive remediation, and don't forget, these are the people who've also had some kind of supported employment or work therapy. The employment rates were much better in the group who'd had cognitive remediation. They were in much, more, much longer in days in work, and they were earning more. This was a, an American paper, so this in dollars. Um, so across the board, they're doing really much better. Um, there was a bit of a difference between whether they had work therapy or supported employment, but I think that study, the number of studies, once you divide them into groups, gets smaller, so it's difficult to be sure about the findings. And it didn't matter how many hours people got it, they all seemed to be doing well. <clears throat> Just wanted to show you one study. This was a group of um, a study from the States by Susan McGurk, who they took people specifically who'd had failures with... Um, IPS program so that they hadn't managed to stay and work. In fact, they'd lost at least one job as a result of um, going into supported employment. And here you can see these are the people who then went on to get to cognitive remediation or nothing. And the people who'd had the cognitive remediation and the supported employment the second time were doing much, much better than the other group. And in fact, this is true for pretty much anything that you measured. So whether they had a job or not, how many hours they worked, their wages and so on, these are all much, much better than with this, so this is supported employment alone and this is the cognitive remediation supported employment. So going on to who benefits, what do we know about how we might be able to tailor it or who we need to put more effort into? I think it's a really mixed bag of results and it's very early stages with this results. There's some evidence that the studies that were including people with more symptoms showed better improvements. On the other hand, there's a number of studies have shown that people who have got more cognitive reserves, so who are kind of still a bit more intact, I suppose, cognitively at the start and who have less severe difficulties are the ones who respond better. And often that's what you might predict. Um, there is a little bit of evidence to show that younger people do better, but again, it's been really quite inconsistent and I, that's certainly not a clear finding. But motivation does seem to be important. So the people who are more motivated are doing better. This is, um, again, that similar study I showed you um, before about with the young people. And here they looked at um, predictors of response to the cognitive remediation in a group of young people with psychosis. And they showed that the people who um, had um, more grey and white matter to start with, they were responding better to cognitive remediation. Now, to contradict a lot of these findings, this is specifically a, a very recent study actually looking at what predicts um, employment rates after getting both supported employment and cognitive remediation in, a, in the States. And this is this total group doing really well. Cognitive remediation does better than the supported employment alone. But it seems to be driven by the people who were starting off at a more... Um, you know, had more difficulties to start off with. With this difficult um, difference was really significant. So that that seems to go against. So it's it's a real mixed bag at the moment. Um, one of the things we know that from the participatory study that we did was that when people felt that they improved in therapy, they felt good about themselves. So it led to increased self-esteem. And when you didn't improve, you felt much worse. Now, research I think often does state the obvious, but it's quite nice to know. That's what you'd expect, isn't it? 
Um, and that's what we found as well in the kind of um, quantitative, the, the numbers, that if memory improves at post-treatment, then people's self-esteem improved, and if it didn't improve, it got worse. And I think that is important to remember when we're delivering therapy, isn't it? We really need to make sure that people aren't perceiving themselves getting worse. There's, there's been a massive burgeoning in studies of cognitive remediation with first episode psychosis in about the last four or five years. And this was a recent meta-analysis where they looked at all of these. It's not a huge number still, um, but the sizes, they were significant, not for the, oh, for the cognitive um, outcomes. They're um, not quite significant, but if you looked at individual ones, they do. But the symptoms and functioning are both significant. But it may be that this is that People are starting at a slightly higher level, so it's difficult to get some movement. And there's also um, coming into all kinds of different disorders as well. So this was a meta-analysis of people with affective disorders, so bipolar depression, schizoaffective disorder, and um, unipolar depression, and all doing really well as well. There's also lots and lots of studies now in, um, for anorexia nervosa for cognitive remediation, and it's just popping up everywhere, really. There's a bipolar disorder study going on in London at the moment that I know about. Okay, so finally, barely see it now, I'm implementing CRT in practice. What do we know and what don't we know? Well, it's interesting because the literature is at the stage where this is now really, really important. I think um, Scotland and New York State were the first places to include recommendations that cognitive remediation should be included in general health services um, in guidelines. But France and Spain have now joined you and soon it's going to be adopted in Australia and Japan and Canada. So you can see we're, we're at a stage where people are, are saying now, like, this does work, how can we implement it? And you know, actually finding out what happens in practice and how we can implement this to actually work in the real world as opposed to these random hours control trials is really what the literature and, you know, the communities are thinking about. So what we don't know is how can we implement this in a way that's actually acceptable to people in, the, in real life, not that they're taking part in a trial, and how can we make it acceptable to the people that are delivering it and feasible? So, you know, this is a long, intensive therapy. How can we deliver this in a way that's you know, cost-effective and still works, but that's actually manageable in um, services. We don't know particularly how much in the coach is important. We all suspect that it's very important, but there isn't much evidence about that. And how do we combine these things with other services to really make sure we can maximise recovery? And we're, um, what we're doing at the moment um, in London is we've, we've got a big programme grant now to look at some of these things. We're going to assess 750 people with first episode psychosis and then we're going to try out these different modes of delivering cognitive remediation, either tensively, individually or in a group or um, more independent. I'm really very honoured to be here, so thank you very much for inviting me and I'll stop there. Okay, thanks. Um, disseminating good practice, that's a really important thing for everybody to see this, and I think this has been a great day to do that. And, and training and supervision, I think this has been a training day for all of us, but um, you're in a brilliant position to set up, you know, be the, the leaders in Scotland for sure, and if not um, elsewhere about, you know, setting up training. It'd be interesting to see whether we can have some kind of um, accreditation for cognitive remediation? Is there some sort of, um, you know, certificate or, you know, a um, qualification that you need that, I mean, those are the sorts of things we've been thinking about. What, what enables? <laughs>